continuing our, our look at um, faith and how faith works and what faith is in here. And certainly that is something every person that wants to have a relationship with God, uh, you know, that is probably the most important thing that we could have is uh, that conviction or that strong persuasion, uh, knowing, and, and, you know, and it's such a strong persuasion that, you know, God says something and just by the evidence that has been already presented, we know that it, you know, we can trust him and that it is exactly what he said. Uh, we left off last week, you know, looking at the benefits of attending Bible study together and had some really good uh, things come up, a lot of good ideas and suggestions and so forth with the, you know, with the advantages of attending Bible study on Wednesday night and Sunday and before that, looking at you know how important it is to read our Bibles and how to strengthen our faith, what can weaken our faith? Because we certainly can, you know, our faith is not always as strong as we would like. And I want to um, kind of move on with that, uh, understanding with just what what is expected of our faith from God. Uh, if you look at that, so, um, someone turn to First Peter uh, two, chapter two, if you could, and we'll start there. We've got several scriptures you want to look through tonight um, regarding how our faith is to be demonstrated. And, you know, while people say, well, you don't need to have any faith or faith only, you know, brother, and nothing else, faith in and of itself really is, spiritually, it's, it's empty, it's shallow, it's inoperable, it's, you know, it, it's inept without doing something along with it. Uh, first, or first Peter chapter 2 and verse 7, can someone read that? Okay, go ahead. And, I'm in a different. I'm in a different scripture that we're going to be looking at in just a moment. First Peter chapter two and verse seven. Yeah, Ken, what version are you reading? Okay, that's what I have as well. Yeah, the ESV. Say that again. Okay, I'm not there yet, so I'm holding my place in a different or in a different spot. Uh, Sabrina, can you read? Can you read that? It's going to say essentially the. You know, it's going to have the same context, but go ahead and read the New King James. Therefore, to you who believe, he is precious, but to those who are disobedient, the stone which the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone. Okay. So when you look at you know when you, when you look at how faith you know how does it work? What do we have to do? Is there any anything expected, or is it really just faith only? Um, you know, when you think. Well, how, you know, and we asked a question last week, or looked at the question. You know, how do I know? You know, if you were to tell me that, well, you have that you have faith, how do you prove that to someone? Okay, I mean, how? You know, there's really no other way, is there? If I just told you, well, I have faith, and you know, you either just have to believe me, just blankly, or you should, you know, you ought to be able to see me show it in some way. But if I just say, well, I have faith, and you say, well, okay, how, how do you know you have faith? And there's absolutely nothing that I have to show for it. Well, then how do you know I have faith? How do I know I have faith? What well, is just some emotion that I have thinking, okay, well, I just, you know, it, it's just my belief that God exists and that um, Jesus, and, you know, and that's great. But you think Satan understood the, the resurrection, Satan understands that Christ is who he says he is. He knows he's the Savior. He knows he's the Son of God. And so for me to simply say, well, I just have faith in it. I mean, does Satan have faith in Christ? No, he knows he's real. But he's not so persuaded that he's going to do something and act on that relationship with him. In fact, we know that Satan tried to tempt Christ when he was here on earth. And so... You know, that word faith, when we start to put it to use in our Christian life, there, ha there are expectations of it. And, you know, Second Peter, or First Peter, rather, second, chapter 2, and verse 7, Therefore, to you who believe, that word believe, by the way, uh, it's the Greek word, um, believe is pistuo. The word faith is pistis, but it comes from the very same Greek word, the same root word is in Greek. And they uh, mean the same thing. Therefore, to you who believe or have that strong persuasion, or to you who you know, have the faith. He is precious. 
Well, but to those who are disobedient, and that right there, it's interesting because you start to see the, uh, the transliteration of what that word means, essentially. That faith involves obedience. Because Peter, asks them, or Peter tells them, therefore, you who believe, he is precious. But, and here's the antithesis, to those who are disobedient, and so that disobedience has to be the antithesis of something. Well, what is that? Believing or having that faith. And so that disobedience, you know, if I have faith, what does that tell me? If disobedience is the, you know, is the opposite of that, what does faith mean? Or what does faith entail? Obedience. Well, obedience for what? You know, if I say, well, I just have faith, well, do you obey? Yeah, I obey. Well, that's doing something, isn't it? The moment you say you obey, you've automatically given up your faith-only doctrine because you're, doing, you're, have, you're admitting that you have to do something. But rightfully so. That's what the Bible teaches right here. Peter says, therefore, to you who believe, he is precious. But to those who are disobedient, the stone which the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone and a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense. And so we know that faith, there, there's, faith can be and it must be demonstrated. Look at 2 Corinthians chapter 13. Second Corinthians 13, beginning in verse 5. If someone wants to get that. Actually, verse 5 and 6. Read. Examine yourselves as to whether you are in the faith. Test yourselves. Do you not know yourselves that Jesus Christ is in you? Unless indeed you are disqualified. But I trust that you will know that we are not disqualified. Okay. That word, first off, I want to I want to define a couple of words with what they mean, you know, in, in the Greek. Um, you know, with, with the original language right there. That word disqualified, when you look at it, is actually translated um, as to be unable, unable to uh, stand the test or rejected, uh, worthless. And so, that, you know, and, and, you know, when we read it in that way, examine yourselves. And that's a, you know, that's a key thing right there with our faith, isn't it? He's telling them, you look, examine your own selves as to whether you are in the faith. Well, if I do an examination, it means that there's something that I ought to be, be able to tell, isn't it? If I exam He says, you examine yourselves to see if you are in the faith. Okay, well, how do I know? How do I know, Paul, that, you know, what, what, what's going to tell me that? He says, test yourself. Something has to be able to be tested. Something has to be able to tell them that they, are, you know, they have this faith, they have this strong persuasion, that they're in the faith that they claim to have. Test yourselves. Do you not know your Do you not know yourself that Jesus Christ is in you? Unless indeed you are what worthless, or unless you're rejected, or unless you're unable to stand that test. But I trust that you will know that we are not worthless or rejected. What's Paul telling them right there? He says, "You, you know," he says. You're going to know that we're not this. Well, how do, how do people know? And that's why he's saying, you know, you examine yourselves to see, and you test yourselves. Well, how, you know, and when you look at the rest of Corinth, what did it, what did it entail? What were these things in which they could examine their, their selves in their lives? Did they just say, well, we have faith all of a sudden? There was something that had to put them in that faith, isn't there? There's something that had to be able to, so they were able to test that faith. There was something that made them, that enabled them to be able to examine themselves. How do we do it? Same way. How do you examine your faith? What do you, you know, how do you know? What do you, what do you, how do you test your own faith to see if you're strong enough in Jesus Christ or knowing that Jesus is in you? Do you just say, well, I just know that Jesus is in me. He's in my heart because I just know it because I just prayed him in. But it doesn't work like that, does it? We don't have anywhere that says, well, Jesus is just going to be in you. In fact, when you look at Christ and what Christ said about the love, if we love him, what are we going to do? Okay, if we obey his commandments, what does that mean? Okay, first off, we, you know, we have to assume now, or it is implied, well, there's a commandment there, right? He gave us commandments. Now what do we do with these commandments? Well, we obey them. Does that just mean... 
well, Jesus, no, I, I love you, but I, and I know you have commandments, but you know, I'm okay just knowing you're there. He says, if you love me, you keep my commandments. That's an action right there, isn't it? There is work involved in keeping his commandments. There's something that I have to do to show that I am going to, you know, in that way I know that, well, I love Christ. That's how he's going to know that I love him. That's how, you know, and if you look at John 15, 14, the same thing. And so when you, when Paul tells them that you, you know, you examine yourselves as to whether you are in the faith, you test yourselves, there's something that had to be done, something they were doing, and that's action, to know that Jesus was in them. It wasn't just enough just to say anything. And it was always like that with Corinth. It was always like that anywhere Paul went with any of these different letters, wasn't it? All right. Uh, Hebrews chapter 3. Hebrews 3, 13. Okay, the writer of Hebrews tells them, you know, tells them to exhort. What does exhort mean? Lift up. lift up, encourage. He says, you encourage or lift up one another daily. Encourage one another daily. Well, it is called today. Lest any of you be hardened through the deceitfulness of sin. How does this relate to sin? Or what to uh, faith, rather? How does encouraging one another daily relate to relate to faith? Build it up. Okay, build it up. I mean, that's our job, isn't it? That's what that's the expectation with the church is to encourage one another. We encourage you know, each other to do things, don't we? We can encourage one, and we hold each other accountable for things. Right. Not just a daily affirmation, is it? Well, you look pretty good today. Well, thanks. That's, you know, now my face is stronger. <laughs> what if I don't look better today? <laughs> what if you really don't mean that, right? <laughs> but that's, but like Katie said, I mean, we can encourage one another to stay faithful and to remain active in our spiritual lives. Look at Acts chapter 17. Acts 17, 16, and 17. Now while Paul waited for them at Athens, his spirit was provoked within him, and he saw that the city was given over to idols. Therefore he reasoned in the synagogue with the Jews and the Gentile worshippers, and in the marketplace daily with those who happened to Okay, so Paul comes to Athens. First thing he does when he when he comes to Athens is to, you know, he knows that the, this was a town that was given to idols. This was a paganistic town. So what does he do? The first place he goes is where? Synagogue. Why does he go to the synagogue? Okay, he's looking for the religiously minded people, isn't he? He's looking at the ones who are probably going to listen to him First, if he just goes straight to some pagan worship service, you think it's going to, you know, you think he's going to make a lot of waves, especially just getting into town. No, he says, okay, I'm going to go where they are, where I could probably have the most effective means to win people over to Christ, because he knows that, you know, if they're in the synagogue, they're probably not going to be pagan, paganistic minded. They're going to be already focused, their minds focused on God. That's where the Jews went. That's where the you know, and, he's, and some of the Gentile worshippers as well. So he goes in there, and what does he do in the synagogue? He reasons with them. What does that mean? He started from where they, from what they understood. And... Okay, that's probably part of it. I mean, he he obviously knew them and knew what their belief was and where they were coming from. Okay, 
So he's talking about religion with them, isn't he? I mean, he's going in there, probably getting on the same track, finding some common ground, because he's reasoning in the synagogue with these Jews. He's reasoning with the Gentile worshipers. And it says he went into the marketplace daily, those who happened to be there. What, you know, what does this have to do with faith? Or how does this, you know, what is, how does this contribute to faith? Okay, he's building relationships with them. If he sees it, you know, especially if he's doing this daily, right? They're going to know, they're going to get to know who he is. They're going to get to know what he's preaching. And Paul ended up winning a lot of converts to Christ. And so he gets in there and he starts, you know, he reasons with this. He's able to build people up in their faith. He's going to help them under, you know, establish their faith, isn't he? And how does he, you know, how do you help someone establish their faith? Well, you go to the scriptures, you show, okay, this is what Christ did. We know this for a fact. And then it's easy, you know, and once people start understanding that, it's easier for them to, or it's easy to, you know, to help them see what God has already revealed to us. You notice he reasoned with them in the synagogue and, and you know, and in other places it says he reasoned from the scriptures. Paul was always mission-minded. He always used the scriptures to help people understand the mind of God and what they wanted. And so this could, you know, you look at what that would have to do for their, for their faith. That's what our job is. It's not just to build up our own faith, but to help others build up their faith, isn't it? To help them establish faith to begin. Because there's a lot of, every religiously minded person is probably going to say, well, I have faith of some kind. Well, faith in what? Well, faith, you know, most of them will say faith in God, faith in the scriptures, faith in Jesus. Okay, but what are you doing to show that? How do you know, other than, open, you know, I mean, opening your Bible is great. Going to Sunday school is great and worship services. But there's so much more to it than that, isn't there? You look at uh, Matthew 5, uh, 14 through 16. Matthew 5, 14 through 16. Matthew 5, 14 through 16. Okay, so this is Jesus talking to his disciples, and he says, you are the light of the world. There's no one else that can be that. Someone who is outside of Christ, who doesn't have that relationship, of course, the church wasn't established at this time, uh, at the time that you know, Matthew was conveying this information. Of course, Matthew wrote after Christ was gone, but he's looking back, writing this about Christ when he was here, and he writes how Jesus had his disciples together, and he tells them, you are the light of the world. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hidden. Don't try to hide it. You can't, you know, don't try to shy it away. Don't try to, you know, don't try to ignore it. Don't try to keep silent with it. It is, nor do they light a lamp, put it under a basket, but on a lampstand. And it gives light to all who are in the house. He's saying, you're the light of the world. You're going to be the one that everyone's going to be able to see. And he, t- and, and he goes on, he says, let your light so shine before men that they may see what? Your good works. Why was that so important? It demonstrates faith. It demonstrates faith. Who said something about faith and works? James. James. And what did he say about it? Faith without works is dead. Faith without works is dead. There's nothing, you know, we can't have faith without works and still have it be faith. It's not, it, you know, James, it's dead. And here you have Christ saying the very same thing. Ye, let your light shine before men. You are the ones that are going to be shining. You're the ones that are going to be able to be out there and be seen. And he says, let, you know, that they may see your good works. Because when they can see your good works, what's going to happen? Okay. What you know? What's your motive, right? You ever had someone? Have you ever done like a really good gesture, help someone out, and you know, and they look at you like, why are you, you know? They get really kind of uh, suspicious, I guess. Why are you 
being so nice. Did that happen? What, you know, what, cause, and why do they do that? Why do they have that kind of response, do you think? Okay. They're not used to people being nice to them. Okay, maybe some, they're just used to people wanting something back, right? But what if we could just tell them simply, well, I'm a Christian. This is what we do. I mean, think of just the impact that it can make when you, just simply by the things that you do and the things that you say and not expect anything in return. You think people will take notice of that? Have they taken notice of that? That's why, you know, you look at Christ. Why, you know, why did he tell them? Let them see your good works, but not for you. You know, we can do good works. A lot of people say, well, I'm going to go help them. And then, you know, people are, oh, thank you so much, right? They are so gracious. They're, you know, they, they have so much gratitude for it. And some people, what do they do? Oh, yeah, well, you know, just... They just love that, you know, they'll eat it up. And it's all about me. And it's all about getting the praise. It's all about getting your name in the bulletin for all the good things you did in the congregation, right? And having someone mention your name from the announcements. And is that why we do things? No. Jesus says, let them see your good works and what? What's that last part? Glorify your Father in heaven. That's why we do our, that's the motivation behind our good works. And you think of how that can build up faith to know that we can, you know, that you might be having that kind of an impact, but to glorify God, not self. I mean, that is just, you know, that's a faith builder right there. People are able to see that and respond to it. They're able to see that, you know, does everyone respond? No. We know not everyone does. But someone is going to see that. Someone's always going to see that. Then we get to 1 John chapter 4 and looking at this demonstration of faith. And this is a huge one right here to, you know, to really sort of pound home how faith is to be demonstrated. 1 John 4, 1, somebody. Beloved, do not believe that any spirit is from heaven, but spirit is from whom whether they are from God. Because many false prophets have gone out into the world. Okay, let's just break this down a little bit, and then we'll move on. He says, Beloved, do not believe every spirit. Okay, what's he telling them right there? Can't believe everything you hear, right? Are there religiously minded people that are going to try to win you to their you know, whatever belief they have? Sure. And they might be the nicest people that you know. They might be a family member. They might be a loved one. They might be a, you know, a good friend, whoever it is. But he says, beloved, do not, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits, whether they are of God. Why? Well, because many false prophets have gone out into the world. Well, how do we test, you know, how can I test something that doesn't do anything? If we're to, you know, because that word, here it is again, beloved, do not believe every spirit. There's that word, you know, do not have faith. Don't be persuaded by every spirit that just comes up to you or every person that comes up to you. Test it. Because many false prophets have gone out into the world. Does a false prophet necessarily know he's a false prophet? Some are just mistaught, aren't they? Some are probably very adamant and they have the best of intentions. Now, some don't, but some do. But are we to follow them just because they're nice and have the best of intentions and maybe they even want me to go to heaven and they're sincere about it? No. False is false, isn't it? And that's why we need to do what we can and we don't need to debate them or just get, aggr or get aggressive with them. But we do need to show, showcase, highlight the truth to let them see it. He says, don't believe, don't be persuaded by every spirit, test the spirits. 
whether they are of God. Well, how can I test something that doesn't do anything? Does that make sense? Well, that's exactly right. I mean, you know, people, we have fact checkers all over social media, don't we? And we get annoyed with them sometimes. But we need to be ready to fact check everything someone says. And if, you know, if someone's wrong, don't just say, well, you're wrong. I don't, you know, I don't believe you. You know, I know you're wrong because I heard it somewhere else or whatever. Be, you know, be ready to show. Because that's what we need to do in order to help someone you know, to correct them, because they may not, like, you know, like Rebecca said, they may not realize that they're wrong, but why would we not want to help them and get to heaven? You know, I always, I, I love the approach that Priscilla and Aquila took with Apollos. You notice how when Apollos, when he was preaching, what was he preaching that was incorrect? Remember Apollos? Why was Apollos wrong in what he was teaching? What was he teaching? Okay. Apollos was teaching the baptism of John. Now, it says not only was Apollos studied, but it said that he had some of the best education. He was strong in the scriptures. He was, you know, he had a great mind. But he understood the baptism of John, and he was teaching what he understood. Even though he had all these other things correct, and he was doing great evangelistic work and probably spot on with everything else, because the scriptures, you know, the Holy Spirit really did a great job of building him up and letting everyone know how faithful Apollos was. But then, you know, Aquila and Priscilla come along, and they see what he's teaching, and what did they do? They took him to one side. They took him to the side, didn't they? Did they say, you know, did they, they, you notice, did they say, you know, hey, everyone, here's a false teacher right here, and call him out and embarrass him and, you know, just, you know, make, a, make an example out of him? No. They took him to the side, and then they corrected him. And when they corrected him, they had one of the strongest teachers of the gospel that, you know, that continued to work with them. How amazing that was to be able to, you know, to, that they would take him and just very humbly, you know, but they, but they did correct him, didn't they? They didn't just let him go and say, no, he's doing great work in other areas and, you know, maybe we should just let him go. No, they knew that he was not teaching the correct way for baptism. And so they said, okay, we're going to, you know, they're going to let him go. But faith, you know, how can I test something though or believe or have that persuasion for something that, you know, just there's nothing being done about it. It's impossible, isn't it? How do I trust it? If there's nothing to back it up, if there's no way to be able to demonstrate it. And so we, you know, if you need to understand that faith is to be demonstrated. But even more than that, as our faith grows, our influence grows. As our faith gets stronger, people are going to start to take notice of how strong your faith is. What's, you know, how many... Who knows what DNA is? All of us probably know what DNA is. Anyone know what it stands or what the, what the correct term of it is? Do you, Katie? What is it? 
I always say it wrong, and I'm not going to butcher it because people are watching this recording, and I'm going to embarrass myself if I try to. If I, but we know what DNA is. What is DNA? What? Okay. The chain of information. It's you know it's it, it's it's a unique genetic fingerprint of sorts, isn't it? For every single person that's found in every cell of the human body. I mean, essentially, it's the building block of the human body, isn't it? I mean, we have DNA throughout everything. And you think, I mean, you know, when babies start to develop, they get their own DNA, right? Which just goes to show you that, uh, you know, that they're not just an extension of a mother's body. You know, we hear mothers say, well, it's just part of my body. No, babies are separate. They have their separate DNA. Separate DNA means that they are a separate being, you know, from and, and all of us are very unique and peculiar in our in the way that we were built with God. And so, you know, we have DNA that's in our blood, don't we? We have DNA that's and the DNA in our blood is the same DNA that's in like our saliva, uh, skin tissue, hair, bone. It's the same DNA. I mean, that's how they're able to tell when there's a crime scene. They're able to scrape off or you know check to see what. You know what, what, who it was, and the gender, and the you know sometimes even the age, and all these other things. So you know, no two people have the same DNA except for twins. Twins have the same DNA. Well, not, not always. Not always. You're right. But do they have the same fingerprints? No. No. Different fingerprints, right? So there is something that you can tell differently between, at some point, even if it's a little more difficult and it involves more work, there's something that we can tell. You know, criminologists will say that no person enters and exits a row, or you know, a house or a row, without leaving something behind. That nothing, you know, anywhere we go, there's not anywhere that you go that you don't leave something behind whether it's just dead skin that we don't realize or, you know, spit from when we talk or if we sneeze or hair or something that we leave behind. Seems something to grow sometimes to people, but that's really how we operate, isn't it? I mean, they can, and that's why they can tell. You know, that's why everyone says, well, I'll clean up the crime scene because we don't want to leave anything. Well, something's usually always left behind that they catch somehow or another. Um, you know, fingerprint. I mean, you know, you think of someone who investigates a, a scene. You know, fingerprint, a footprint, a trace of hair. Uh, you know, blood, saliva. Doesn't matter. Thread of clothing. Any of these can identify someone at a crime scene, can it? Our example works the same way. There is not anywhere that we go that we are not going to leave some kind of impression. Now, it might be really minuscule for people that we might leave, you know, we might just, you know, if we have people constantly coming in and out of our life, don't we? Constantly. You say hello to someone, they might think you're nice. You say, excuse me, you know, you're in their life. But we have people constantly that talk to us and we talk to them, even if it's really briefly. But you think some kind of an impression is made. If I was to just bump into you on the street, just that kind of, you know, just that quick of an exchange, if I say, oh, excuse me, sorry, you know, you're going to think I'm a jerk? Same situation, I go and I bump DJ aside and I say, get out of my way. <laughs> what kind of an impression? That quick, isn't it? He's going to get that impression of me. I might be having a bad day, but he doesn't know that. And it's the impression that he's going to leave, that's going to be left with him, isn't it? But everything that we do, we can't stop being an example to someone. Someone's watching us. When you don't even realize it, when you don't even expect it, there are people that are constantly watching us, and our faith is going to play a major factor in what they think of it. Expand on that. Okay. And he won't. I mean, when 
we talk about it so that we don't. Okay. You're absolutely right in that. Night. But if, when you have someone that, you know, when, when you're dealing with someone, they get to know you and they get to know how nice you are. They get to know how even nice he is. Are they going to take an, in, you know, an interest the longer they get to know you? <laughs> they're eventually going to know he's an atheist. <laughs> That's just how it's going to be. But they're also going to get to know you in certain situations. You know, how do we, you know, when, when someone comes in and we meet them and we talk to them, you know, uh, granted they know we're all Christians or they probably have a pretty good idea, right? They're going into a worship service. But they meet someone, at, you meet someone at work. And when you're constantly nice to them and you're, con- you know, and you're not chewing them up or whatever the case might be, you, you know, you set that example, you're going to be an example to someone. Even if you're just nice and you think nothing of it. You think, okay, it's the right thing to do. I'm just going to be nice to them. But you think, in their mind, that could go way further than what we even intend it to go because we're just being nice. We might be unaware, but someone's watches, someone's listening, and your influence has a significant impact on others. You have the ability to shape others' thoughts and impressions whether it's the church, whether it's you know with the Bible, whether it's concerning worship service, interest in God, serving, getting involved, you have the ability to shape impressions because they watch you or they see you and they see how you handle it. That's an amazing thing to think about to, that you know we could have that kind of even when I don't think about it. We're gonna you know our. You know how we how we do things, how we act, is going to rub off and make an impression on someone. Now comes the fun part, and I promised Dee that she could do this. So, <laughs> okay, you think about uh, you know you think about dominoes. I'm going to let her do this. And I'm so glad you have the time to do this. All right, good. I hope this works. <laughs> uh, yep, go ahead. <laughs> What happened? One domino fell. One domino fell. And what happens with, and it just affects the next one, which affects the next one, which affects the next one, doesn't it? That's what happens with it. That's our spiritual life. That's the impact that our faith has. We don't, you know, we don't just stop usually with one person either, do we? And you think that you're, you know, someone you affect can, inf- can affect someone else or impact someone else. Because it, as you, as we discussed at the top of the hour, when you, know, you, you encourage someone else, you build them up, it's going to build up their faith. And they build up your faith. And that's how we get this done. And as you build up someone else's faith, they're going to go out and they're, because of that faith, they're going to be as good a person as they can, possibly can for Christ. Understanding that faith for Christ. Does it make sense? And then they're going to do it. And you think just, you know, what an amazing thing it is with the church family to know that all of us will start impacting other people. And as we, you know, and as we study and as we get to know more people and as we bring more people to Christ, and as their faith, their faith begins to grow, they're able to affect other people. But that's what it is. Movement, you know, movement of one affects someone else. What I do is going to affect someone. Someone. And it may affect more than one person. I don't know. And it all comes back to why our faith is so important to establish and make sure that we get this right. Katie, go ahead. Okay. Did you have something to add to that? Yeah. Okay. I mean, it's kind of similar with me. I mean, mom hadn't saw Rhonda. You know, Pat and Danny had been taking her in. I probably would have never been in the room. She 
however, never make it earned by the United States. And now several lives have been impacted. Isn't that interesting how one person meets another one and how you impact them so much that that person goes on and then here you are yeah. impacting other people because of that one you know that because of the one encounter that you have with you, you know, with getting to be friends with Rhonda, Rebecca. Oh, good point. Someone that might just be watching you or observing you. Absolutely. That's a great point. I mean, that's just, yeah, and what is it, you know, what, what kind of, I don't want to use the word pressure, but what kind, you know, what's the weight that's put on us as Christians? Knowing that that can happen, is it important? Because if we, you know, because as we have impact, and we've been talking about being a positive influence, and we're going to be talking the next few weeks about this impact. Next week, um, we're going to start looking. I want to look at the first chapter of Ruth because it really is a strong example of what it means to really, you know, to build the faith and just being that, in, you know, strong, have, being a strong influence, which stems from having that strong faith. But while we have all this positivity through faith, is it possible also, though, to want to do all the right things but send a negative impact or to show a negative impact? Let me, let me rephrase that. What happens when I'm a Christian and people know I'm a Christian and I make a choice that is completely unchristian, completely unbiblical, Unchrist like. Okay. And how many how many times does it take to do that? Just once. I mean, you think about that. People, if people know I am that I follow Christ, and I'll just I want to get more into this. You know, is it possible for us to you know send the wrong signal, the wrong message with a Christian, even though we might not want to? That is a you know, and that's a really big burden when something like that happens because we can really destroy you know the influence that we have in someone and we might be that connection to Christ we might be that one person that's in their life the only kind of Christian that they know and then they see us do something and then what does that do we'll pick this up next week and uh, with the conversation